Thank you. Uh, it's a pleasure to come down and uh, be able to talk to this audience this evening. I know a lot of you have heard um, through the news media a lot about uh, the marine mammal uh, and blue whale strandings that occurred last fall. And this is a chance to see a little bit, a little bit more up close, kind of what went on, what we did, um, the kind of data we gathered, and some of the conclusions that we've uh, been able to draw from the, that data we gathered. I do want to uh, point out to the, uh, the parents who have brought young children, um, we do have a fair number of graphic slides. Uh, when you work on large carcasses and you're carving them up and you're going into them to find causes of death, um, the imagery is going to be pretty graphic. So um, if you have any concerns about that, now would be the time to exit <laughs> because we will. <clears throat> we're going to have a number of slides like that uh, in tonight's lecture uh, in order to bring uh, bring forward and show you the kind of evidence that we look at uh, when we're uh, trying to diagnose cause of death on an animal. Uh, Michelle and I are going to tag team this lecture this evening. Uh, I'm going to kind of give a little bit of an introduction, uh, talk a little bit about uh, some of the uh, problems we faced in dealing with large marine mammal uh, whale strandings um, and how we dealt with those, and then talk a little bit about what necropsies are, uh, what we're attempting to do when we go in to gather uh, baseline data on dead animals and determine cause of death. And then I'm going to turn it over to Michelle, and Michelle will kind of talk about the event that happened, talk about each of the animals that uh, came in, uh, the kinds of samples that we collected and some of the analysis uh, that we've been able to do on those animals, and then some of the conclusions we've been able to uh, draw um, that uh, speak to the cause of death on these animals um, that came in last fall. Now you'll notice on the, on the table up front, after the lecture's over, you're welcome to come up and take a look at some of the materials that we brought. Uh, we brought some of the flensing equipment that we use when we're doing large whale necropsy work. So a lot of you probably never seen a large whale flensing knife or some of the kinds of knives that we use the flensing hooks. Uh, we also brought uh, the earwax plug out of one of the adult blue whales that uh, we were able to get the plug out of the uh, ear canal inside that, that adult whale and we brought that along. Uh, we also brought some uh, bones that I've cleaned up from one of the fetuses of uh, one of the blue whales that uh, um, we, uh, uh, that stranded on San Miguel Island during this event. So uh, feel free after the lecture to come up. And as far as questions, we'd like to take the questions towards the end so that we can get through the main presentation. And I'm sure there'll be a lot of questions during the course. Um, if you could hold them until we get uh, to the end, and then uh, you know we'll leave it open as long as you want to uh, ask questions. Uh, Michelle and I will try and um, answer the questions that you've got. So let's um, let's get started. So I'm going to talk about logistics and challenges that we faced uh, in dealing with a large whale uh, uh, stranding event. I'm going to also uh, kind of introduce you to the, uh, what a necropsy is and what what we attempt to do. Uh, uh, when, we, uh, when we do need necropsies. And then Michelle will take over and do the history of the large whale strandings and ship strikes in Southern California, the description of this recent blue whale stranding event, and then the results and findings from the necropsies that we were, were able to do on the animals that stranded. So first off, logistically, um, we faced a number of uh, problems as it relates to these large whales when they, get, uh, when they die and they show up. Uh, they don't always show up in uh, opportune locations where you can easily work on them. So uh, a lot of times these are first spotted when they're floating on the surface of the water. Um, and you can't work on a carcass when it's floating in the water. So logistically, we have to wait till that carcass comes on shore uh, where we can actually work on the carcass. And hopefully it comes on shore at a place where we can get equipment down and we can get onto the carcass safely. Um, if it isn't coming ashore, then um, and it's a very fresh animal, and we have the capability to be able to retrieve that carcass and bring it ashore in order to conduct a necropsy, then that's the next uh, real logistic uh, factor that you face. How do you get a large whale that's floating out in the open channel on shore? And then where are you going to land it? Who's going to let you put it on their beach uh, in order to carve it up and make a big sting? So logistically, that was a, that was a big issue here in, in Ventura County, uh, dealing with that. Uh, so arrange, arranging that beach for uh, access to conduct the necropsy was, uh, was a real problem. Uh, and then assembling the team. These are really large animals. Uh, they, they fill a good part of this room and, and beyond in terms of the length, 72 feet, 73 feet on these things. Uh, and it takes a team in order to do, to, to do an effective necropsy on, on, on large animals. So uh, Michelle was really effective at bringing together all of the individuals that really played key roles in, in conducting the necropsy on these animals. And this is just a picture kind of showing uh, the team that was assembled to work on the whale that we actually towed ashore down at Point Magoo. We also had issues related to remote access. Uh, these whales don't necessarily wash up on a nice uh, sandy beach that you can easily walk down to and work on the animal at low tide. 
Um, sometimes they wash up on a remote beach out on, the, out on one of the islands. Uh, you, logistically, you have to get out there. You've got to figure out how to get you, your team, and your equipment out to that, uh, onto the island and then out to that remote beach on the island in order to work on the animal. And this is just an example of we were lucky enough to be able to work out the logistics and the funding to be able to do this uh, access to this particular blue whale and the fetus that came out of this blue whale that washed in on Symington Cove uh, in late November uh, of last fall. Um, and we used helicopter to get our team out, a much smaller team, in order to work on that animal at that point. We also had problems when you uh, get a whale and uh, you're trying to get it on the beach, uh, it'll just roll around in the surf. Well, you can't work on the whale while it's rolling around in the surf. You actually have to get that whale stranded on enough of the beach that it's dry enough that you can get around it and work on it and it's not moving around while you're trying to carve on it. Because it's really dangerous. Um, part, of, part of what we ended up having to do was work out arrangements to get heavy equipment to come down and give us a hand with being able to pull carcasses further up on the beach in order to gain access to it. And then also, uh, to utilize the heavy equipment uh, during the proce process of the necropsy uh, because the heavy equipment could move large blocks of muscle and tissue and organs out of the way so that we could get at the next piece of the animal that we needed to look at. So uh, challenges uh, that we faced uh, in doing uh, these large whale necropsies, first off is safe access. These are really big animals. When they're moving around in the surf, as these pictures, uh, as you can see, it's really dangerous to work around those carcasses when they're flopping around and being pushed around by the surf. What happens is the carcass creates a, a, a pit in the, in the beach uh, from the, uh, the waves moving around it. And then the waves rock that carcass back and forth. Well, when it rocks one way, it opens that pit. If you happen to stand close to it, you get sucked under it. So you can end up getting crushed by the, carca by the carcass of the whale and caught underneath it if you're not careful. So, uh, when water's moving around that carcass and it's being washed around in the surf, it's really dangerous. And so on the uh, lower slide here, this is an example where we just hit a tidal cycle where the tide didn't go out far enough that we could get all, all the way around the back side of the animal safely. Uh, it was just in the, in the part where it was washing around. This animal here we couldn't access until uh, we hit a low tide when the uh, tide was far enough out. And this one, uh, in order to get this attached, I got knocked over three different times by the uh, tail of this whale as it was moving around in the surf. It, it completely knocked me over and dropped me into the water, uh, trying to get the, uh, the straps attached to the back of the tail. So safety is a, a primary issue when you're, you're going to conduct necropsies on animals like this. The other is crowd control. The first uh, <laughs> the, these blue whales that came in here in Ventura County stranded on a beautiful spot. It was right next to Highway 1 and 101. Uh, the main train traffic would stop and people would uh, get out and take pictures. Uh, everybody along the highway would stop and uh, quite a few people wanted to get down right next to that whale, touch it, feel it, smell it, um, be close to it. And you can't have large numbers of people down on a carcass like that for the, some of these same reasons. They can get injured in the process of getting too close to the carcass. They can get injured in the process when we have heavy equipment down there and we actually have really sharp equipment that we're working with in terms of the knives and other things. So it was real important uh, that we had safe access for the necropsy team to work on these animals without having the public right on, on our shoulder while we were working. Uh, but this, this was kind of cute. We got the cheerleaders. <laughs> <laughs> uh, another, another one is the media. It was really important uh, uh, that the media be kept informed uh, of what was happening during the process as we worked on each of these animals and to provide the media with correct information so that the media is not getting incorrect information and then that, it, it, it kind of grows from that incorrect information getting out. So we had to have part of the team that was assembled to deal with these necropsies had to deal with uh, uh, the media, solely with the media, and they would transfer what information we were getting uh, during the course of the necropsy to be able to get that out to the media as soon as uh, we felt comfortable that we had some basic conclusions or some information that we could provide the media about what was going on. Uh, this is, uh, the next one is, you know, it's a big stinky job when you work on big dead whales. Um, and there's no two ways around it. Um, it stinks up the whole area you're working in, it stinks up the beach that you're working on, it stinks up the equipment, the people that work on the animals. Um, and you just have to get in it and do it. Um, so, um, working on large whales, you get used to it. Um, <laughs> So, what's a necropsy? Necropsy is um, technically the, the definition is it's a post mortem examination or an autopsy of a dead animal. Uh, it comes from the Greek word meaning uh, seeing a dead body. And it's, it's composed of two different elements. The first part is an external examination of the animal, and the second part is an, an internal examination of the animal. Um, 
So in terms of the external examination of the animal, there's some basic things that we do whenever we go out to work on, a, on an animal that washes in. And Michelle and I work as part of the Marine Mammal Stranding Network here along the west coast of California. We're responsible for responding to dead cetaceans that wash in in Santa Barbara, Ventura, and San Luis Obispo counties. And we've been doing this uh, for over 30 years now and recording basic data on dead stranded cetaceans that come in. And every time we go out on an animal, we have no preconceived idea of what the cause of death was on that particular animal. We go through a series of steps and gather a, a, a similar set of data off each animal before we draw conclusions on why that animal died. And so the first is, you want to uh, you identify uh, uh, what it was. Let me see if I can get back there. Oops, it's going fast. Um, so we ID it, uh, determine the sex of the animal, uh, photograph it, we take a whole suite of external measurements on the animal, and then we'll collect a series of samples off the outside of the animal. First we'll take skin, skin's used for getting DNA, for DNA analysis and looking at stock uh, assessments. Um, we uh, collect blubber, uh, which can be used for heavy metals and uh, pesticides and other things like that that can get concentrated in the blubber. And then any ectoparasites that are still on the outside of the animal, we'll collect those also. Then we inspect, uh, thoroughly inspect the whole outside of the animal that we can actually see. Now these big animals you can't roll over and see the other side. You see what's there, what's exposed, that's out of the sand and out of the water at the time that you go to begin to work on the animal. And so that's what we inspect at the time we, before we actually cut into the animal and start to work on it. And basically we're looking for any evidence that there's signs of trauma to the, uh, to the animal that might have been caused by human interactions. Then we go into the internal examination, and this is where we actually take the big knives and we start to cut into the animal and work our way down through, through, through the uh, carcass of the animal. We'll inspect the internal organs and the skeleton for any evidence of uh, trauma or disease uh, in the process of going through the whole animal. We'll collect organ tissues if the animal is fresh enough and you can get fresh enough tissue off of the animal. Uh, we can use that tissue for histological analysis and and in the lab, uh, you know, look for other signs of disease or pathology that come out uh, in that histological analysis. We collect blood and serum and urine and feces, all of which are used in various types of tests to look for factors that are uh, affecting uh, or causing death or disease in marine mammals. And then uh, if we can get into the stomach and or the gut tract, uh, we'll look for any, any sign of any kind of uh, stomach or gut contents. And we'll try to collect that material because it gives us a window into what were these animals eating prior to the time that they died? And a little bit about how they're functioning in the ecosystem. Um, if they're endoparasites, uh, like nematodes and hookworms and other things like that that live inside the GI tract or in any of the organ systems that we go through, we'll collect those at the same time in order to look at kind of the pathology of those uh, parasites. So as you can see uh, from the pictures here, uh, these are big animals. Everything's big uh, when, you, when you open up these uh, large carcasses. Uh, you can see how big that heart is on that lower picture there. Um, at the time that we're taking samples off these animals, uh, we set up a station where uh, one, uh, one or two people are processing all of the samples that are coming off the animal, bagging it, labeling everything, getting it in either on ice or into the proper medium for uh, pres preservation, um, so that when we get the stuff back to the lab, we'll get the maximum use out of that material. It's not going to have degraded to the point where we're not going to be able to get uh, effective data from it. On these large whales, we found that having access to heavy equipment was really, um, really beneficial for us in being able to do thorough necropsies on these really large whales. Had we not have, had heavy equipment to help out in the process of the necropsy, we wouldn't have been able to do as complete a necropsy on these animals as we were able to do. In this first uh, picture up here, you can see uh, these big excavators. There were two of them that worked with us on the blue whale down at Point Magoo, and we were able to use the uh, excavators to rotate this animal. It was originally laying with its belly up. Well, you like to go through the belly in order to get at all of the organs. Well, you can't excavate, you can't climb on a big carcass that's all oily and slippery with big, huge knives and everything and start cutting. You can slip inside of that carcass from up above and, and be lost down inside of it. So you can't carve from the top side down. So using the heavy equipment, we could rotate the animal they held on to the carcass until the sand built up behind it from the waves, washing the sand in. Then they let go and the animal was oriented so the belly was facing us. So then we could excavate off tissue and material off the front side of the animal and use gravity to bring that right down onto the ground. And it allowed us the capability of starting the front end of the animal, working our way all the way down to the tail end of the animal, uh, organ system by organ system as we went. Uh, we also used the heavy equipment in the dissection process. 
So if, if we were working on a lung and we got this, uh, the tissue samples we needed from the lung, but we needed to look down below what was under the lung, uh, then we'd have the heavy equipment come in and hook onto the lung, and we'd cut a little bit, and then have the heavy equipment lifted out of the way, and then we'd work on the next uh, chunk of uh, the animal down underneath it. Uh, the heavy equipment was also, also used to help haul away that kind of material, dig pits on the beach, and bury some of that kind of material on the beach. So you can see these are just some uh, examples of the heavy equipment operating down at the Point Magoo animal. We buried uh, the organ material that came out of that animal was what we buried on the beach at Point Magoo. And then the animal was towed back out to sea past the shipping lanes and released. Uh, our thought was it was going to sink. It never, it never sank. <laughs> it came back, right? It kept coming back uh, further south. Uh, it went into L.A. County and down along beaches of Malibu. And, uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It grows. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to turn this over to Michelle. She's going to take the rest of the lunch. Oh, yeah, that's it. Okay, thanks, Bob. So um, I'm going to begin with a little bit of our history of uh, the stranding work that we do at the Museum of Natural History. And as Paul mentioned, we've been collecting data for over 30 years. So our data goes back to 1975. And um, you can see the peaks and valleys, but on average, we respond to about three whales per year and about nine dolphins per year. Um, you can see, starting in 2002, we have much higher numbers than in the previous history. And that's not a reflection of more animal stranding. It's more a reflection of uh, dedicated grant funds to the Marine Mammal Stranding Program. So prior to that time, we didn't have dedicated uh, funds specifically for this program. So um, as you can see, funds definitely help out uh, with the workload and <clears throat> paying for the ability to get out to the animals and then analyzing the animals once we get to them. Um, so uh, with an average of three whales per year, you can imagine that three blue whales in a few weeks is, is a lot for us. So um, this gives you kind of a temporal breakdown, a seasonal breakdown, and generally most of our strandings are during the springtime. It's kind of our busy time for strandings. And that is more of a reflection of, uh, well one, that's when the bi um, biotoxin domoic acid blooms. And then it's also the breeding season, and sometimes you see normal mortality associated with the breeding season. And this is a history of the bluebell strandings, and this is just for our museum, so it's just Santa Barbara, San Luis, and Ventura County. But in our history, um, since 1975, we've only responded to or reported on six blue whales. So over more than 30 years, we've had six blue whales, and then Last year, in, in 2007, there was five that stranded. So you can see by keeping good records, you know when something is abnormal or not. If you don't have the history and the data collected to know what's normal, then you don't know what is abnormal. But um, looking at our history, you could tell that even just two blue whales in a week is what we had during the, during the beginning of it. We knew right then that that was abnormal. Um, something else to note is most of our blue whale strandings are in August, and that's generally the peak time for blue whales in the channel. And um, this one January record is more just bones on the beach, and that's when the report was generated. It's not, we didn't have a blue whale in January then. Um, but something that's pretty interesting here is um, four years apart on the same exact day we had a blue whale, which I thought was interesting. And also something to note is that four out of our six blue whales stranded in Santa Barbara County. So Santa Barbara County seems to be the hot spot for uh, blue whale strandings, although this past year they were obviously in Ventura County and then um, some in LA County as well. This shows you the reported whale ship strikes in Southern California. So this takes into account San Luis Obispo County south to, um, to San Diego County. And this is a database that's accessible on the web and it, it has uh, who uh, has all whale ship strikes reported from 1985 to 2001. And this is reported ship strikes either from captains um, or based on documentation um, from a necropsy performed or um, any other evidence that we have for a, a, a whale that's been struck by a boat. And you can see here that our average is only 1.6 a year, a little bit more than one and a half whales per year. So again, this type of data helps us for when we have two whales in a week, we know that that is something abnormal, it's 
something else is going on. And um, what also is interesting to note is that most of our ship strikes are gray whales. Uh, blue whales only account for two of our ship strikes in the history. So um, again, we knew that having so many blue whales in a concentrated period of time was something out of the normal. In general, uh, half of all ship strikes are fatal to whales. And um, injuries are usually when the ship captain has felt an impact impact and then has seen the whale swim off but has seen blood in the water or has noticed that there's some injury to the whale and they report it. So um, about a quarter of the cases the, a whale, uh, the ship captain will report hitting a whale and seeing some injuries but then the whale is never recited again. And then um, unknown is when the captains report hitting a whale and the whale swims off and they don't see any evidence of injury and they don't know what happened to the whale. Now when we break it down by county, you can see that Los Angeles County accounts for half of the, stri of the ship strikes for uh, the Southern California region. But um, this is really an artifact of the fact that there's two, harbor there are two ports there, the Port of LA and the Port of Long Beach. And so whales will get struck outside of the LA County area and are brought to port on the bow of the ship. So they're not necessarily all being hit in Los Angeles County. They may be coming from the Santa Barbara Channel or coming from the south, but they're being brought into the ports there, and so that's where they get counted. So um, now I'm going to go through the, um, the history of what happened during the fall of 2007, and this kind of gives you an idea of how things unfolded. Our first blue whale came into Long Beach Harbor on the bow of a ship on September 9th. And, you know, as I said, we get about 1.6 per year. So when that one came in, it didn't really ring any alarms. It was the time for blue whales to be in the area, and one was struck by a ship. And it happens from time to time. Um, however, two days later, a second whale was sighted in the channel floating. And it was believed that it was a ship strike. Um, but we didn't really have too much information on this animal. I have September 11th circled here in red because that is the day that Navy sonar exercises began off San Clemente, uh, San Clemente um, Island. And a lot of people were wondering if those sonar exercises were related with the mortality of the blue whales. And so I'm going to uh, talk about that in a little bit. But I just wanted to let you know that we had already had two whales dead before the sonar exercises began. On September 12th, the third blue whale was sighted floating off San Clemente Island. And um, so again, this whale was probably also dead before the sonar exercises began. The Navy flew a biologist out to a ship that, was, that had spotted this floating whale, and um, they couldn't find the whale after that. So it was never recited. So it was never very clear if this San Clemente animal was the same as the Long Beach animal, because the Long Beach animal was towed out to sea. Um, since we can't confirm that, we are calling this our third blue whale in this event. So right there you can see in, in uh, four days we have three blue whales. And so right then and there we knew something was going on. This is out of the normal for us, well above our averages. And so that's when, st when we started talking with the agencies about proceeding um, into more of an investigation mode of what was going on. We had talked to the National Park Service about towing this animal to Santa Rosa Island, uh, but by the time that we could get back out and recite it, it had traveled too far east to do that, so we just waited for it to make landfall. It did make landfall and, on, um, on the 13th and was necropsied on the 14th, and it, the, all the animals in blue are the ones that we necropsied. And then a week later, um, our colleagues down in Baja had emailed us some photos of another blue whale on the beach down near Ensenada. However, by the time they uh, uh, were on scene to look at the animal, the Mexican Navy had already towed it offshore. So um, we didn't really get any good data from that animal. However, the photos indicate that it was a very fresh animal. So we are not considering this uh, Baja animal to be the same as the San Clemente or the Long Beach animal, given its level of freshness. Uh, we don't give this animal a number in our head count because it's not in the U.S. waters. And our 
stranding program is only for the United States. But it is interesting to note that during this time frame, we did have another one just south of us. Finally, a week later, we had another animal um, sighted off of platform Grace, and we had tried to wait for that one to make landfall. We uh, gathered our team and assembled it, and we were prepared to do the necropsy on Friday, but um, it never made landfall. So we ended up towing it to shore and necropsying it on Saturday. And as Paul said, we don't normally tow animals to shore. But given the situation that was before us, we saw what was going on, we really needed to get fresh samples from a very fresh carcass. And that was the incentive to tow the animal to shore and work on it. Generally, we would have just waited for it to make landfall and then worked on it at that time. October went by without any strandings. And then at the end of November, we had our fifth blue whale out on San Miguel Island. Uh, it was very decomposed by the time it was um, um, sighted out on San Miguel. And so it's possible that that animal had been dead for quite a few weeks, so possibly October or early November. So again, if you're not a visual person, if you like lists, um, we had five whales in total. We had three that um, our museum responded to. We, we responded to whale number two, whale number four, and whale number five. So throughout this talk, I refer to these as the Santa Barbara's channel whale one, two, and three. So it gets a little confusing, but um, just bear with me. Um, as you can see, we had um, two males and two females, and then uh, the whale out on San Miguel Island was pregnant with a fetus that was a male as well. Um, mostly adults or subadults. Some of the males were in the subadult range, and some of the females were in the adult range. But um, in general, um, the whales were a little bit on the smaller side, not their full um, 80 feet that they can get in this area. So this is the first Santa Barbara Channel blue whale, or whale number two, if you're looking at the overall um, total. And this is the first report and the first picture that we got from our colleague Bruce Mate. And he was out tagging blue whales, and he saw this one floating. And um, you can see it was in fairly good condition, not super fresh. This was um, on September 11th when we had talked about towing it to shore. So it was right about here above Santa Rosa Island. We were going to tow it to here. Um, by the time the winds kicked up and we couldn't get back out, and by the time um, any other sightings were on the animal, it was already 26 miles to the east, almost to the east of Santa Cruz Island. So it was already too late to tow that animal <coughs> to a beach. We had just waited for it to make landfall. Um, on the morning of the 12th, it was in the southbound shipping lanes. By that afternoon, it was uh, in the northbound shipping lanes. And then by that afternoon, uh, by the evening of the 13th, it had landed uh, on Hobson County Beach. So traveled pretty fast, which we were surprised. We had thought we had another day or two to kind of get everything together and wrap up for it. And before we knew it, it was already on the beach. So uh, this is that first picture that I showed you. When you look underneath the blubber layer, you can see the point of impact. And you can see this is all bruising and, and bleeding in this area, hemorrhaging. And you can see there's almost no indication on the skin of what was underlying that tissue. So a lot of times these animals get struck by boats. And unless you really cut into the animal and look for evidence of ship strike, you may never find it. A lot of times these animals are so big and so difficult to deal with that when we do get reports of a floating whale, we take the report, but we don't really do a thorough investigation. So I believe that those ship strike numbers that I presented earlier are probably well below what's actually being struck because it's very difficult to do a thorough necropsy on these animals. So again, a little close up, you can just see compared to a human how big and extensive this bruising area really is. This is the second Santa Barbara Channel blue whale, or whale number four overall. And when this one was first sighted by, um, it was first reported by a boat, and then the sanctuary did an overflight with the Coast Guard, and recovered these pictures, and we saw how fresh it was. That's when we knew how important it was to be able to access <coughs> these animals to collect the data and the samples that we needed. So that is why, uh, because it didn't make landfall the next day, that's why um, with the decision making um, at National Marine, Fisheries, National Marine Fisheries Service headquarters, 
uh, with us and the sanctuary and our regional coordinator, Joe Cordero, we all decided it would be best if we could tow this animal to shore. Um, again, trying to find access to a beach that would allow us to tow it to their beach and work on it there was very difficult. Uh, it was a Friday, and apparently the Navy um, has every other Friday off, and this was one of their Fridays they had off. So it's, it got to like the head admiral of the Navy, and they were calling me, giving me approval. And I had no idea who I was talking to, and when I told someone later, they were like, oh my goodness, that was like on top of the top. But we just needed a beach, that's all we were concerned with. Um, so we were very grateful for Point Lagoon to allow us access to their beach. They allowed us great access for all of our team to get on the beach. And they also allowed access for the media to meet us out there, which it's a lot to get everybody through security, and you know how it is. And so we were very grateful for all of their assistance on that. And by this time, the media was all over it. Above the fold, full color photo on uh, the Los Angeles Times, it was big news. And as Paul mentioned, it was really important for us to get our message out. We knew that there was a lot of people out there blaming the Navy or blaming aliens or blaming whatever. There's a lot of people trying to blame. And we wanted to make sure that the correct message got out so that we weren't in cover-up mode or in, in backpedaling trying to, you know, to, to <coughs> disprove what, they, what other people had told the media. We wanted to get the facts out first. So our... Uh, our PR, our head of public relations at the museum, Eastern Mormon, was just incredible about um, up to the minute sometimes um, news flashes out to the local media and um, allowing them access. And she was kind of filtering our information to them for us because we were really busy trying to work on the animals. So she was, she was very instrumental in getting the news out to the media. So this is the necropsy on the Point Lagu animal. Um, you've seen a few of these photos before, but um, by the time it made it to shore, it, it, they, they hooked onto the animal about three in the afternoon, it, and that was off uh, platform Grace, and it made it down to Point Lagu at about five or six o'clock in the morning, and then it took a few more hours to secure it on the beach. And I think we started working on it at about 10 or 11 o'clock. By that time, it had some pretty good predation by um, <coughs> some different sharks. And um, however, when we looked inside, the organ tissue was still in fairly good condition, and we were able to get some pretty good samples from it. Finally, we had the third Santa Barbara Channel blue whale, or whale number five overall, that was out on San Miguel Island. And this animal um, was very decomposed, as I mentioned, and it had expelled a fetus on the beach. We know that it expelled the fetus on the beach because of how close they were together. If this animal had expelled the fetus out in the water, it's highly unlikely the fetus would have been that close to it. We do know it was a fetus because it was only 13 feet, and blue whales were born at about 25 feet. So it still had to almost double in size. Um, as Paul said, it was difficult to get access to the back of the animal. But um, from the photos and from the observations made, it was clear that a ship propeller had cleanly severed the flipper off of the whale. And right there, you can see the radius and ulna. That's what you're looking at there. So a clean cut right across the forearm. We do know that that occurred from a ship propeller. However, because the animal couldn't be um, examined internally, we don't know any other injuries to this animal. So we are considering this animal that it was um, did have involvement with a ship, but we don't know what exactly was the um, extent of that damage. Um, this is a close up of the fetus, so a very rare find. Not, not very many people have seen a blue whale fetus, so it's really interesting to be able to get samples out of the fetus. And this is uh, the team collecting some bones and skeletal material and some other tissue samples. And some of those um, bones are over on the table, so be sure to have a look at those after the presentation. <clears throat> um, and then, so from these necropsies, we were able to confirm that it was a ship strike that killed these animals. It was a collision with a large vessel. Some of the indications are shown here. This jagged break on the rib. Um, in the documented literature based on bright whales, they've also seen these jagged breaks from collisions with ships. So it's very well documented that this is the type of injury you see from, from blunt trauma on a large vessel onto an animal. 
Additionally, you can see the, the vertebral column here, part of it, and these dorsal processes were all broken off. And you can see how dark they look at the tips of the bones. That indicates that this injury occurred while the animal was still alive. It was blood, these tips of the bones were bleeding when the animal died. If the animal was already dead and, these, and it was hit by a ship and these broke, you wouldn't see the bleeding there. Wouldn't, the heart wouldn't be pump, pumping blood through that area, so it wouldn't be actively bleeding, and you wouldn't have this staining of the bone like you get as bruising. Um, down this lower slide here, this is the vertebral column here. It was completely severed on this animal. We didn't do that. This, this part of the vertebral column was free-floating in here. So some pretty massive trauma occurred to the animal. Also in this area, you can see um, a lot of coagulated blood, which indicates that the animal was bleeding when it died. So another indication that the animal was alive when it was hit by the boat. And finally, in this last slide here, you can see that's actually a piece of the skull. So almost like an eggshell fracture to the skull. And if any of you have seen the skeleton up at the museum, you, can, you know how massive these bones are, massive, massive bones. So for the ship to cause this much trauma to the whale is a very severe impact. And the animal obviously died instantaneously from, from this impact. Now, I'm going to go through all the data that we collected, and um, while this was going on, we knew that the animals were being hit by ships. We saw the first animal with the big contusion on the side and the broken bones. We saw this animal with the broken bones. We had the animal that came on in the bow of the ship. We knew that, that these were being hit by ships. We knew that that was the cause of death. But we had to go through and still try to figure out, is there something predisposing these animals to being hit by ships. We've never seen such a large amount of animals being hit by ships in a concentrated period of time like this. So we had a lot of questions about the sonar issue. We had some questions of was it domoic acid related? And then we also were wondering was there some kind of disease or illness that had impaired these animals and predisposed them to ship strike? So to begin with, we knew that at least the first three animals had already died before the sonar exercises began. Um, so we knew that those animals were not sonar related. The point of view animal did die within the time frame of when sonar exercises were occurring. We did look at the tissue in and around the ear bones and we didn't see any obvious signs of trauma to that area other than what the ship had caused. But again, there's still a lot of speculation in the peer review literature of what you would see in and around the ear bones in a sonar incident. However, the true facts really show it all. This red curve here is the hearing range for a blue whale. And again, this is based on models of information that we know from right whales and from uh, some of the smaller cetaceans. It's also based on the information that we know of the hearing range, or, or sorry, of the uh, frequency calls from the blue whales. So all of this information gets put into models, and that's how they come up with these curves. They don't actually do hearing tests. Raise your right flipper if you hear the beat. <laughs> it's really based on models. So there is, there may be some, um, these may not be 100% the hearing range for a whale, but it gives you a good overall general <coughs> range for where the animals um, can hear. And if you see here, this red curve here is below the range for this mid-frequency sonar, which the um, Navy was using at the time. It is in the range of the low-frequency active sonar, which you've also heard in the media, but that's not what was going on at the time. It was this mid-frequency sonar that they were using. And so in order for this blue whale to hear this sound, this curve would have to extend into this range, which it may, at the very top of this curve, slightly extend into this range. But as you go up on this y-axis, that also increases in decibels. So that means at this point, this sound source would have to be extremely loud or extremely close to the animal's ear for this animal to be able to hear that, that frequency range. So I compare this to the cell phone ringtones that teenagers and kids have that they claim their parents can't hear. And this is because adults lose part of their hearing range as they, as they grow older. And um, the kids still have that frequency range that these ringtones are ringing in. 
So if that phone's in your child's pocket, chances are you're probably not going to hear it. However, if you take your child's phone and you hold it next to your ear while it's ringing, you probably will hear it because it'll be a louder decibel. It'll be closer point source to your ear than your child's pocket. So you probably would still hear it if it was right next to your ear. Same thing with this. For this animal to hear in this range, it would have to be very close point source sound to the ear of the animal. And we know that San Clemente Animal is not that close to the San Barbara Channel. So we don't suspect that the animals can even hear in the range of sonar. So we don't suspect that the sonar had any, um, at any involvement with disorienting the whales, predisposing them to being uh, hit by the ships. We also suspected that possibly demoic acid was to blame. And um, for a little background on demoic acid, um, demoic acid is a toxin that's produced by a diatom of the species of the uh, genera uh, Pseudonychia, produced by several different species. And um, what happens is, is, as you know, the blue whales, they feed on krill. Krill feed on phytoplankton or, or smaller plankton. And um, so if this plankton was producing demoic acid at the time that the krill was feeding on it, and then the blue whales were ingesting enough krill, they could possibly have been affected by the demoic acid toxicity. It's a neurotoxin that affects the brain, and we see it cause seizures in dolphins and sea lions and in birds. Um, all of the tests that we did on the feces of these whales, and then on also some live free-floating whales, like living whales that had defecated in the water and some fecal samples were collected, all of them came back below detectable limits for demoic acid, which means that there was no demoic acid present in those feces at the time of the ship strike or in the live animals when they defecated. We also test, uh, uh, demoic acid is also an amnesic shellfish poisoning. Uh, there's also something called paralytic shellfish poisoning, which is caused by a toxin called saxitoxin. We also tested these animals for saxitoxin, they also came back negative. So we know that biotoxins were not involved in predisposing the animals, it disorienting them in any way, so allowing them to be hit by the ships. Um, that we have found demoic acid in a live animal. Feces for a live animal in 2002 were tested and actually had very, very high levels, much higher, about tenfold higher levels of demoic acid in its species than we see in, in smaller cetaceans in the common dolphins. But the animal was still alive. So we do know that blue whales can withstand a much, much higher toxin load than some of the smaller cetaceans. Um, we also looked at pathology. We thought maybe these animals had some kind of illness or disease that we couldn't see just by looking at the overall um, organs, maybe it was something microscopically going on or something congenital going on that was causing some kind of illness in the animal. We didn't find anything that significant enough to cause mortality or disorientation in the animals. <clears throat> However, this is one of the first documented full necropsies on blue whale. And so there's not a lot of information in the pathological record of published literature on normal disease process in a blue whale. There's a little bit from the whaling days, but nothing as detailed as we collected. So what we found wasn't significant in the, to the cause of the mortality of the animals, however, very significant for the contribution to science. We did find a protozoal cyst in the cardiac muscle, the heart muscle of the blue <coughs> whale. Um, it was a sarcocystis cyst, which is very prevalent in the marine environment. It's prevalent in wildlife, in cattle, in uh, domestic livestock, it's a, it's a pretty prevalent parasite that is passed from herb herbivores to carnivores. Its uh, final life cycle is in the carnivores. It's usually found in skeletal muscle or axial muscle, um, but not totally uncommon to find it in the heart muscle. So as I said, this is a very significant documentation. It's never been documented in a blue whale before. We've never had the opportunity to look at microscopically at a blue whale heart before. Uh, but pathologically, it was in an incidental. Again, we found a nematode inside the lung of the blue whale. It's very common for marine organisms, um, marine cetaceans, to have nematodes in their lungs. We see it very commonly. 
Uh, but again, we've never microscopically analyzed the lung of a blue whale. So while it wasn't pathologically significant, it was still interesting to document. So we ruled out the sonar, we ruled out domoic acid, we ruled out pathology, we ruled out some of the biggest players that could have affected the animals in predisposing them to being hit by the ships. So really what it came down to was it was behavioral. The animals were much farther inside the channel, farther east than they had been in previous years. And this is tagging data from September 23rd on in 2005, 2006, and 2007. And you can see that in 2006 and in 2005 and in 2006, the animals are farther outside the channel, a little bit more off point conception, farther west. If you look in 2007, the animals are concentrated in the channel. And this is some of John Kalamakitis' data. He was tagging in early September, and he also noticed that the animals were much farther east than he had normally found them and were swimming and feeding within the shipping lanes. And I know a lot of you in here have worked with John and heard a lot of his presentations in the past, but for those of you that aren't aware, John places a tag on the whale and it monitors their diving, their diving and their feeding behavior. His tags do not satellite link his data to him. He has to recover his tag and download his data, which gives him great incentive to stay with that whale until that tag falls off. And he had indicated to us that while he was staying with these whales, waiting to recover his tag, he was also dodging large ships. So not only were the whales dodging the ships, the researchers were as well. So it indicates the animals were feeding in the area while these large ships were moving, um, mostly in the southbound shipping lanes. Um, and he'd also had noticed that the animals were feeding a little bit more shallow than they normally do during the day. So during the nighttime, they usually had the shallow dives, but during the daytime, they were feeding on surface krill, which also was not um, causing the animals to dive deep while they were feeding. So these animals were up at the surface feeding, and then the whales came along, and they didn't even know what was coming. This is also a slide from John, and um, this shows uh, southbound and northbound shipping through the, the channel. This is a three month time span. So it just kind of gives you an indication of the amount of ship traffic that we have and the path that these ships are, are following. These are, uh, this is some data that I found from the Marine Exchange of Southern California and one of their reports. And um, this arrow indicates September 2007 when we had the bulk of the ship strikes. And you can see that um, Nothing was out of normal. We didn't have more ship traffic than normal. Um, and as you can see here, there's really no increasing trend in ship traffic. So what it really came down to was that the whales were feeding at the wrong place and were being hit by these ships. It had nothing to do with any other outside factor. It was purely a behavioral phenomenon. And what you can see here is um, if you kind of squint your eyes, you can see a fin whale here across the bow of the ship. Here's the rostrum, the, the mouth area. Here's the pectoral flipper. You can see some of the ventral feeds here and the rest of the body here. So a lot of times these ships have no idea that they even hit a whale. They'll come to port, and this is coming into a port up in Puget Sound, and they don't even know that they have a whale on them. Sometimes they can go back and they can check their logs of when their, their boat slowed down a little bit or when their um, miles per gallon changed a little bit, and that's when they realize that they hit something. But this bulbous bell protrudes out of this ship and it provides, um, it causes the, the bow break to be a little bit farther um, up on the, farther back on the ship than right up at the bow. So um, it's pretty quiet at the front of the ship. These ships can be up to a quarter mile long with the engine in the back. So a lot of times these, these blue whales don't even hear the ship coming, and this bulbous bell is right there and hits them. And you can see from some of the earlier slides how much damage that bell can do to a whale. And so what it came down to again was we were able to rule out any other causes, and it was purely a behavioral event where the animals were feeding on krill that was at the surface, farther east, 
than it normally was, which was putting the whales right inside the shipping lanes and causing them to be hit. And this is one of John's tagged animals that he took a picture of. And you can see how close the ship is to this whale. Imagine John on his little inflatable out there, these big ships passing by. So again, when you're working on a large whale and you're working with so many different factors, the animals are still floating, trying to bring them to shore, or the animal hits the shore. There's more people to thank than are even on here. But there are so many people that helped out and came through with resources or um, expertise, um, provided support, aerial support. The sanctuary did a lot of overflights of the shipping lanes. They were constantly in communication with us, with the Coast Guard and with Marine Exchange to try to get information out to mariners of where these, where these whales were congregating and also where, where the dead whales were floating so that ships wouldn't continually hit them. Um, a lot of the staff at the museum helped us out. The NOAA Prescott Stranding Grant Program um, provided funds for this and actually most of the funds to tow the animal to shore and to work uh, on the beach with the heavy equipment came from Moss Landing Marine Labs. They had a large whale stranding grant, and they allowed us to have access to that grant, which is very generous. It was a large, it was about $25,000 that they gave us money for. So we're very grateful for all of our colleagues up and down the coast that helped us. The Marine Mammal Center, uh, Francis Gollum, the veterinarian there, came down for all of the necropsies. And um, one of the vets from San Diego SeaWorld, Judy St. Ledger, came up we had a lot of help from other um, scientists and researchers and vets from the area. And again, all the Channel Islands parks and sanctuaries and Ventura County parks also were very instrumental in allowing us access to these animals and helping us collect the data that we need to really find out what happened and why it happened. It's easy to say, yeah, the animals got hit by a whale, uh, the, the animals got hit by a ship. But if you can't rule out everything else, you really don't know what's going on. So it was very, um, it was just a huge boost for, in, for the scientific record to be able to collect the data that we did and come to the conclusion that we did. So thank you for your time tonight. Paul and I are here for questions. And then again, make sure you uh, go peruse the tools that you